you kind of have these four, what I'd call basic principles regarding money yeah. that I think most people aren't familiar with. I said, let me interview the smartest people in the world financially, the Ray Dalios, the Carl Icons, the Warren Buffett, the Paul Tudor Joneses. There are four core things they all agreed on. The best investors are focused on not losing money. Then there's asset allocation. When I interviewed David Swenson from Yale, he said, Tony, you're gonna be wrong no how smart you are about picking the right stock or bond. You're gonna be wrong and you're gonna be wrong on timing. 95% of your investment returns are based on what he called asset allocation. Third piece is really important don't take giant risks. They look to see how they can get asymmetrical risk reward. It means how do I take the least risk with the most upside? Then the final one is the one we all know, diversification. You want to not put all your eggs in one basket. The biggest question people are asking is like, how do I get those returns? This is the part most people don't know. For the last 35 years, the S&P 500 has given a 9.2% return. 9.2% private equity average ones are 14.2. That's 50%, this is mind blowing right here. 50% greater returns every year compounded year after year. So a million dollars you put in the stock market 35 years ago, it's worth $26 million today. But if you put it in private equity, it's worth $139 million right now. That's why ultra high net worth people have almost half of their money in private equity and only 29% in public equities. Someone's listening, they're like, hey, man, you know, I want to get control of my life. The, the money part, awesome. What about my life? What about my emotions? Yeah. What about my family? Yeah. What would you say to them? Most mm. people know what they don't want. And so where focus goes, energy flows. So the first step yeah. is like, what do I really want? Why do I want it? Because the why is even more important than what? Now you got to be honest. You got to get to the truth and tell yourself the truth about the gap. Because all of us have a gap between where we are and where we want to be come up with a you know a quick plan not a perfect plan but a quick plan to attack it with massive action mm -hmm. and then what do you do now you got to face your dragons you got to make the changes that are necessary you become more by facing these challenges you learn and you grow and then you bring that back home and you experience you know the rewards of being the hero in your own life and that's in essence mm -hmm. what people need to be able to do Hey, it's Ed Mylad. I just wanted to thank you for being here, and I would ask you to please subscribe to the show. If you just click the subscribe button here, I would really appreciate it. It helps the show grow so we can get even more successful guests on the program to help you. At the same time, if you're subscribed, you're going to get access to the programs before anybody else in the world gets access to them. So if you would, click subscribe right here. Thanks so much. So hey guys, are you frustrated with where you're at right now, maybe stunted in your progress? Well, if you are, I want to recommend a place for you to go called Growth Day growthday.com forward slash ed it is the number one personal development app on the planet it was created by my friend brennan bruchard it's got all kinds of high performance techniques in there courses accountability journaling live speeches from some of the top influencers in the world including me all right welcome back to the show everybody my guest today he's been a friend of mine for almost 30 years i was thinking about it as i was prepping for this i've known him for 30 years Holy cow! and he's a is that crazy he's a uh he's a global icon and he's the number one life and business strategist on the planet, peak performance expert, New York Times bestselling author over and over again. Uh, my favorite part about him is his entrepreneurial spirit, which a lot of people don't know about because they see him just changing other people's lives. And his th philanthropy work is unprecedented. And he's somebody that I admire, that I've looked up to, and has made a huge impact and difference in my life, as I know he has for millions of you. So Tony Robbins, welcome back to the show, brother. Ed, good to see you, man. You look like you're in great shape. A big surprise, you're a workout fiend. <laughs> I love seeing you so healthy and strong. Thank you, man. I'm trying to hold together. Likewise, uh, and by the way, when you're looking at this, everybody, he is 10 years older than me, even though it doesn't look like it. So I'm going to probably throw a stronger filter on this today than I normally do. A couple of things I want to mention to you all before we get going, because you don't get the chance to do this very often, which is Tony's hosting a virtual event for three days, yeah. and I and it's free. I, I still cannot get over the fact that you can get access to the person that I think the last 50 years on the planet has helped more people change their lives than any single human being. And yet you can get access to him for free. And so this event is January 25th through the 27th. It's called the Time to Rise Summit. You should register. And if you'd like to register, you can go to jointony100.com. That's jointony, the number 100.com. Go register for that event. In these times, you're going to need it. And then the second thing, 
which I'm thrilled to talk about today. We're going to talk about life. We're going to talk about money today. Mm -hmm. And the other thing Mm -hmm. is that he's got a book out now, February 13th, 2024. If you're listening to this before, go pre-order it. After, go grab it. The Holy Grail of Investing. It's the third book in a trilogy of books that Tony's written on money. And this one right here, we were just talking off camera, is bananas and is going to be incredibly enlightening for so many of you. There, There's information in this book you have never heard anywhere Frankly, even if you're a pretty sophisticated investor, and so I highly recommend you go grab that book. So let's jump into both those today. You ready? Sure. Whatever you want to go. Let's start with, I think, to set the stage for both, Tony, is where are we economically? Because I think this dictates where we are in our lives and our money. Last time you were on, you said, look, I think we're in for a winter. I think it's going to be a long one. I'm curious as as you evaluated at the time of this recording, because clearly things aren't great. You've got a couple wars going on. There's disarray all over the planet. But then on the other hand, you know, in the United States, inflation seems to be getting somewhat under control. Yeah. Unemployment's not real high. You know, I, I go to a mall, it's packed still with people in there buying stuff and consuming. So based on all of those conditions you see, what's the state of the union right now in your mind? Well, you know, if you study history, and I think you and I have talked about this before, everything moves in cycles and they're they're pretty predictable cycles. Uh, So, you know, I always tell people that if you want to be good at anything, investing, you want to own a business, you want to have uh, a great body, you want to dance, you want to say anything you want to do, you need three skills. The first skill is you got to have pattern recognition. If you see anybody that's good at anything, they recognize patterns and it makes them not fearful. And then the second thing is pattern utilization. It's nice to see a pattern, but if you can use it to your advantage, you become a great investor. You become a great business person, right? Because you know the patterns and you're not fearful because you know these patterns happen over and over again. And then eventually it's kind of like if you play other people's music long enough, you're able to create your own patterns, right? You build on what you've learned. So I want my kids to learn those three skills because as AI is coming, there's so many beautiful technologies. I know there's a lot of fear about them because anytime something new comes, especially with the capacity of AI, there's going to be a lot of fear that goes out there. But you have to decide. You're going to live in fear. I was talking to someone the other day, and they're like, "We're on the verge of, you know, a nuclear war, World War III." And I said, "Okay, well, you're going to sit here and worry about whether a nuclear bomb is going to be dropped on you. Let me just tell you, if it happens, you won't even know it. You'll be vaporized. <laughs> it'll be over. So right. You don't need to, you know, a courageous man dies one time or woman, right? A coward dies a thousand mm-hmm. times because every time you imagine, mm-hmm. it's there. So we're living in a season that is predictable if you study history. It goes in about twenty year cycles." And think of it this way. There's a springtime where everybody's optimistic. If you run a business in there, you look like a genius. You're just in the right place at the right time. We then are, have a correction time or challenging time, a summer that tests you. It's hot and difficult. And if you don't take care of what you've grown, it falls apart. If you make it through those two seasons, you get to fall where it's a reaping time. It's beautiful. It's easy. Somebody wants to loan you money for a house and you don't even have an income. You know, you know those types of days, right? right? right. Easy money, right? right? Interest rates are nothing. You can do it all. And then we always have that followed by winter, right? And winter, it looks like Mm -hmm. it's going to be bad forever and people overreact. So if you look at those four seasons, you start looking around and you can see that if you look back and you look at humanity, back, you know, when we were hunter-gatherers, we had a lot of fear because we hadn't recognized one pattern, the pattern of the seasons. Once you know seasons, you know you don't plant in the winter. It doesn't matter how hard you work. You do the right thing at the wrong time. It's not going to work. You got to plant in the spring and you got to take care of it in the summer and so forth. Once we learn that, we could stay in a community, we could build. There's patterns in terms of think of four seasons of a person's life. Zero to 21 roughly is kind of springtime. Some of us had to go to work at 13 or 14 years old, but most people are pretty protected for the most part in their youth. People tell you what to believe. They teach you how it's supposed to be. But then you enter 22 to roughly 42, and you're the soldier of society. You're that person that goes to war, literally. You're the person who goes into business. And now what happens is you decide to test what you believe. And you think you're unbeatable. You're going to be president of the United States. You're going to be a billionaire. You're going to have 100 perfect relationships simultaneously, and everyone's going to be happy. And then in your (laughs) 30s, you discover, holy (laughs) a relationship's not that easy. I'm not a billionaire (laughs) yet. And so you get humbled <laughs> right. and you, you start to grow, but you also test. 43 to 63 is the power season. That's the reaping time if you planted in the spring. Otherwise, it's a weeping time if you didn't, right? True. If you worked hard in those first two seasons, you, you know, you and I both can do more with our pinky now than we work 24 hours a day. And if you work 24 hours a day now, 
You can move mountains, right? Because you know the right people, you know the right principles, you know the distinctions, you can cut through to it. Now I have 111 companies now doing $7 billion in business. That's a real understatement. It's the conservative number estimate. It's actually much higher than that now. But to give you a perspective, I mean, I couldn't even run three companies at one stage, right? You know, it was, it was overwhelming to me. So your mm. skills get stronger. And then think of 64 to 84 to 104, 120 is the oldest humans. That's the winter time where you now are more of a mentor in society. You know who the hell you are. You're not trying to convince yourself or anybody else who you are. If they don't get it, you don't really care. You just want to <laughs> give back and do beautiful things because you've lived life long enough. And then you look at how are things different in the 60s and 70s compared to the 50s. Very different values. The 80s, 90s, 2000s, very different values. And so people grow up in different environments. But if you live long enough, we're all going to be tested. We're all going to go through all the seasons. So it's a long way of saying, where are we right now? If you study history, we're in winter because the primary emotion is fear. And things get magnified in this environment. Social media now right. is a tool that does that. The regular media does. And they're good people. They're not They're not trying to do anything but meet their job. Their job is to make more money for the shareholders. And the way I do that is get your attention. That's why I have clickbait. Because it doesn't matter whether the story is good or not. If you click on it, I'm paid. And we all know fear sells. So that's why we live in the world we're in. We're in this for a period of time. Right. Not all winters are the same everywhere on Earth. And right now, America is still positioned to do pretty well. We have a lot of challenges that I'd be faced. There's a lot of change that has to happen for us. But I'm optimistic. And I also know that these people that people look down on who think, you know, they haven't had it hard. There's some truth in that. You know, you, you grow up differently when everything's at your fingertips on your phone. But what's true. really nice is the challenges will make them strong. Because here's the history of the world in four sentences. Good times create weak people. You can see it in, in thousand years of Roman history over and over again. You can see in Greek history. You can see it anywhere. So good times create weak people. Weak people create bad times. Bad times create strong people. Strong people create great times. And then it happens again. And you can see this mm. history after history. So I'm optimistic about the future because we have so much technology that can change things here in the United States. We are leaders in that. AI is one of those pieces. But there's also technology changing our bodies. We talked about this last time because I wrote the book Life Force and interviewed 150 of the best regenerative scientists in the world. I mean, we're 12 years from what they call longevity, you know, um, the, the term they use. What is the term they use? It's longevity um, escape velocity. What that That's means right. is, yes. what it means is in 12 years, you know, if you talk to the very smartest people in the world, you know, that are the best in the world at what they do, like Ray Kurzweil, he's been the most accurate predictor of technology, bar none in history. Or you talk to George Church from Harvard, who's the genesis, genesis. They both say about 12 years, roughly, is what they both estimate. Every year, our technology will allow us to be a year younger physiologically, as long as we don't get killed in a car accident or something like that. So if you take care of yourself for the next 12 years, roughly, maybe it's 15 you're going to be exposed to technology change everything. CRISPR is eliminating some diseases. The first one approved is dealing with sickle cells, just done last month. And they can literally cut it out of your genetic code. And so you don't get it, but neither your kids. I mean, this is wild. So it's not that simple. There's moral decisions to be made. There's going to be consequences to any new technology. There's going to be disruption. But overall, we have an incredibly bright future, not because I'm optimistic, because I'm not. I'm a realist. I just look at the history. I see how things work. When we make it through winter, it'll be a new springtime. It won't be forever. Will that be another four years, five years, seven years? I don't know. But we will get to the other side, and then it'll be optimism again for another 17, 18, 20 years. These history patterns are there. So the real secret is there's two worlds you got to master, your own internal world and the external world. You can't control the external world. You can influence it. But if you take control of your mind, your body, your emotions, and your actions— you can have an extraordinary quality of life in winter. People freeze to death during winter. Some people sneeze, ski, snowboard. They build a fire. They build their business. So it's up to you. Instead of complaining about the season or pretending it's not winter, you want to take advantage of it. I grew up, my started my business in 1977, 78. That's old I am. And we had 18% interest rates. So when people complain about 8%, you know, I just think I of like, if they were 18%, right, people would be sacking the White House, you know, <laughs> saying know. this is so insane. True. But that's the yeah. world we're in. So we're living in a challenging time, but an exciting time. And most of the problems we're facing, whether it's crime in the streets, a lot of that's driven by policy, whether it's the wars we're talking about, whether it's fighting internally within people, 
the common disease that everybody has is selfishness. And when you don't face enough challenges, you focus on yourself a lot and it never makes you happy. The cure is love. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds corny, but love is when you care about something more than yourself, whether it be your children or your mm -hmm. community or your country or you know the people that you want to serve, feeding people, whatever your thing is, those are the things that give us energy and allow us to succeed. So we need to just stop complaining and put ourselves in a place where we make ourselves more resourceful and more resilient and get stronger, you know, instead of praying, Lord, help me, it's like, make me stronger so that I can turn right. these things around. And that's, that's my approach to things. I love that. I, it's turned in for a lot of people, Tony, though, world events, the economy, what's, it becomes their primary obsession. It just yeah. does. I mean, more than ever, because what you said, the media, social media, and there's, you know, one thing I tell people recently is like, there's some, you're kind of hiding in that obsession to some extent. I mean, if you can be so obsessed with what's going on in the world and the conditions of the world, you don't have to pay very much attention to what's going on in your world, in your family, in your finances. That's it's right. one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted Tony's event to be promoted is because those will be three days where you can focus on your world, your inner world, so you can change your external results. And so, again, join Tony100.com. Go register for that event, guys. It's a big deal. So, hey, guys, as you know, I've partnered up with my good friend, Brennan Bruchard, who's created the greatest personal development system that has ever been designed called Growth Day. If you go to growthday.com forward slash ed, you can get all the information. But it's that time of year where everybody's trying to form new habits. They've got new resolutions and goals. And you need an environment and you need some coaches and you need to be able to do it super inexpensively. And that's where growthday.com forward slash ed comes in. There's everything from journaling to accountability programs, live messages every Monday from myself and other influencers. There's an opportunity for you to, to get courses that would cost thousands of dollars completely for free. It's incredible. Go to growthday.com forward slash ed and check it out. So, hey, guys, you know, when I love technology and a great idea revolutionizes an old industry. And by the way, if there's an industry that needs a revolution, I think you'd agree with me, it's the healthcare industry. It's not easy to find good doctors. And by the way, good doctors that are in your area that also take your insurance. And that's why I love ZocDoc. They are revolutionizing the healthcare industry and the way you get access to doctors. ZocDoc, by the way, is Z-O-C-D-O-C. -O -O Here's who they are. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. Tons of different reviews on the doctors and they're local to you. You can find out if they take your insurance. I just did it for a tear I had in my shoulder. One day later, I'm in the doctor's office getting some help, getting an order for an MRI. So go to ZocDoc.com slash mylet and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot -O com slash mylet. ZocDoc dot com slash mylet. I wanted to ask you that, like a harder question. And that is, how does someone condition change? So you used the word patterns earlier, right? Yeah. And in both of our work with different people, they've got where they've got because they've developed these patterns. And maybe they do read a book or they come to a one-day event or something like that. And there's change, but how do you condition change in somebody? Is that what you would call immersion over a three-day window? Or is it some habitual change when they get back that's task or routine-oriented? Conditioning change is kind of the rub. I think it's like the next level of, of advice that's given to somebody that you know I don't see being discussed very often. I think it's a hard question, so I'm curious as to what your answer is about conditioning a change. Let me give you two quick answers to it. One is how I did originally, because I didn't know how, right? I started reading all these books. The first book I read when I was, you know, just, you know, 17 years old, my mom kicked my dad out. She chased me out with a knife. I knew she wouldn't kill me, but I wasn't going back in that house. And I was like, okay, I'm walking in the rain trying to figure out what to do. I stayed in the laundry room of, on the second night, first night on the hill and it rained. So the next night in the laundry room of a friend's and I had a small amount of money, like, I don't know, 19, 20 bucks. And I took the bus and I went to this bookstore I'd seen years ago before. And I got this book called The Magic of Believing by Claude M. Bristol. And in the book, it talked about conditioning your mind. And that it talked about not affirmations, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. And your brain goes, BS, you're not happy. But incantations mm -hmm. is when you speak it, you engage your body with such intensity. Now, today I understand when you want to change something, you change the body, you change your focus, and you change your language. When you change all mm -hmm. three of those things radically, somebody's depressed uses their body a certain way. They talk with a certain tone of voice. They focus on what they can't control. 
They focus on things in the past they can't shift. They focus on what's missing. It's not hard to figure out what's going to happen. They use words like, I tried, I can't, I don't know. There's what I call a triad. These three things are done a certain way when you're depressed. If you change that person's body radically, the tempo they speak, their voice, you change their focus to what they are in control of, you change their language, everything shifts. Well, when you do incantations, think of like affirmations only speaking it aloud with total intensity over and over again with repetition, it's like conditioning right. your mind, your body, and your emotions at once. So I was working in these two banks, mom kicked me out, and they were in San Marino, California, near Pasadena, California. Mm -hmm. And I worked there, I was still in high school, and I would take the buses there because I didn't have a car. My mom kept my car. It was a 1960 Volkswagen bug. And I got there and I cleaned the banks because it wasn't by the hour. It was by the result. So I cleaned two banks. I was really good at it. I did a really good job. And by finished by two in the morning, I get on the bus. By 3.30 in the morning, I'm home. I go to sleep, wake up on four hours sleep and go to school. It was pretty brutal. One night I come out of the bank, changed my entire life. I'm waiting for the bus, waiting for the bus, waiting for the bus. 45 minutes, no bus. There's nobody around. It's three in the morning. I got to get home. Mm. What the hell am I going to do? I know I can call and do this. I'm a million miles away. So all of a sudden, a guy comes creeping down the street, and he rolls down his window and goes, hey, buddy. So I'm at the bus stop. He goes, didn't you see the paper? There's a bus strike. There's no way to get home. So what did I do? Part of it was initially anger with my mother kicking me out. And I'll show her. But then I remember I read this book. So I was doing these things every day at every way. I'm getting stronger and stronger every day at every way. I'm getting strong every day in every way. I'm getting stronger and stronger every day in every way. I'm getting stronger and stronger. I did that for the first 20 minutes, then happier and happier, healthier. I ran 13 and a half miles. I never run two miles in my entire life. It wow. became the power that I still tap into this day. I literally found a part of myself by demand, by conditioning, by the end of that, like I was utterly certain what I can do. You know, when you see an athlete, a kicker, you know, on a football team, a basketball player about to do a free throw and you think they're going to miss it. You can tell before they release the ball or kick the ball. They're yes. Gonna miss it. You see they're lacking certainty. When you look yeah. at somebody like Steph and he releases that ball and he turns and doesn't even look and it's already a swish. People go, oh my yes. God, he's a genius. No, he's being rewarded in public for what he's practiced a billion times in private. Steph told me he shoots, and I've seen him, 500 shots every single day of his entire adult life from the time he was a teenager. But just take his 15-year career, 500 shots a day, 14,000 shots a month, 168,000 shots a year, 15-year career, 2.52 million shots he's taken to make 3,300 to be the greatest three-point shooter in history. That's conditioning, mm -hmm. right? You do it. Mm -hmm. You do it. You do it. Mm -hmm. You do it. But there is a way to speed it up. When Stanford came to me and wanted to do that study on depression a couple of years ago during COVID, they wanted to see, they saw the results, they couldn't believe it, right? People that get depressed, they had two professors that had gone, no more clinical depression whatsoever. So they wanted to do the study. The most people, 40 per, 60% of the people that get treated with drugs or treat or psychological treatment are still depressed. That's the meta studies. 40% improve, average improvement, 50%. They're half as depressed. They did it with us, 100% of the people after five days from Date With Destiny, not a single person. A year later, 11 mm. months later, nobody did it. 17% of people had suicidal ideation. None was suicidal ideation. How did that work? Well, we mm -hmm. changed the perceptual filters, what people focused on, what the things meant to them, what they do, but we did it for five or six days and nights of total immersion. And since they followed me mm. for three years biochemically, they were interested because they discovered this biochemistry that Tom Brady experiences, that the Tampa Bay um, uh, hockey team that's won so many Stanley Cups, you know, the Lightning have, have done. They go into a state. If Tom Brady's down in the fourth quarter by 10 points and he, he's got two minutes, there's no way you're going to win the game. Something happens to him biochemically that happens to me every time I'm on stage because they measure me for three years. They call it the championship biochemistry. My testosterone surges to a level that's insane, but so does my audience. They follow me. So at that level, wow. anything you think about, you remember. That's why the retention is so high. You remember where you were in 9-11. You don't remember where you were in 8-11. You don't remember those moments because wow. there's not enough emotion. Wow. There's so much emotion. Secondly, wow. normally there would be a huge amount of cortisol. That's the stress hormone that gets in the way of your performance. For Tom, for Tampa, for me, my cortisol drops through the floor while my testosterone is rising. 
that puts you in this state of absolute push certainty and drive. Doesn't guarantee you're going to win, but it increases your chances about a hundred fold. My audience, not only my live audience, my live audience, when we went during COVID to digital, where I had people in 195 countries participating, like we're going to do, for example, for the three days, yeah. they went around, sent people to 15 different countries, took their blood, just like me, took their saliva, measured them. Every single one of them went through this exact same pattern. And that's why 11 months later, 72% decrease, and I've never seen them again, 72% decrease in negative emotions, 52% increase in positive emotions. In business, it's all engagement. They measure engaged, disengaged, actively disengaged. Engaged, you're really into it. Disengaged is like quiet quitting. You do the minimum. Actively disengaged are people that are angry and actually trying to screw you over in your own business. Mm. COVID's four mm. years destroyed engagement more than any time in the history of the measurements. And at levels no one could even dream of. The one that grew the most was active disengagement, people actually angry trying to mess up the company. We did in six mm. days, they're doing a one-year study. Most studies like this are a month to three months. Largest one they've ever done, 750 people. At the, the end of the six days, update with destiny, five and a half days, every single person was higher than they were before COVID, meaning their engagement was through the roof. But what's really cool is they're measuring it. The year ends this month. But I saw the six month review every month, they increased their engagement and their effectiveness. And I never spoke to them. I never saw them again. Why? Because it's in their biochemistry. Why? Because they have whole new filters in their brain. So you can do it through incantations or you can do it through some form of immersion. Well, they took the best professor at Stanford, won all these awards, had him teach my exact content as a contrast group, word for word, but without the things I do to change biochemistry. And he still got 300% increases in retention that he's never seen before on the content. But mine was 3,000%, right? And his wore off after, I think it was eight weeks, and mine a year later was still producing the results. So there is a science to changing your conditioning. So you can do it rote by incantation. Do it rote by having new rituals. There's so many ways you can do it. But the most powerful way I know of is total immersion where we engage your biochemistry and your emotion. And what's so cool about it is time disappears. You know, when you ask people, what's a long time? Some people say a century. Some people say two minutes, right? A long yeah, time is any time you're not enjoying yourself. You know, That's a minute right. can feel like eternity if it's a horrible experience. But if you're having mm -hmm. a great time, time disappears. And you know, even the events, yes. we go 12 hours yep. a day literally around the world, yeah. when I'm doing my events here, like the last event I just did to hear a date with destiny, we had people in 195 countries. So it's every country in the world. We had like, we'd start here at 10 AM. It's already midnight in Australia. They go from midnight to about one in the afternoon for six straight days in a row. And we lost 1% of the people, give you an idea. It's that engaging, right? They're in a whole different time zone. It doesn't matter. They're in the zone and our biochemistry has changed. And so that's why I love yeah. books. But the reason I still do seminars is because there's nothing like an immersion experience like that. And now people can do it from anywhere on yeah. earth or they can come in person and do it too because now that COVID's over, we do both. Yeah, and that's, by the way, this event at jointony100.com, I want you to go. It's just, that's because you have immersion over three days. Here's what I just want you all to do so that I'll give you my simple language from that. Success, bliss, achievement, ecstasy is a biochemistry. Yes, It's a neurochemistry and a biochemistry. And so... If you want to find those states of being, it's a biochemistry. And so just for a lot of you, something really simple to do, when you're training physically, if you work out, you run, you walk, these are times where you should be anchoring your goals and your visions of your life when you're in that elevated state right. of neuro and biochemistry. It's just a much more powerful anchoring and conditioning for you to create a change in your life. And so elevated emotional or physical states and anchoring the things that you want in your life, your visions and your goals and your ambitions. Now you're anchoring the biochemistry and the neurochemistry. The likelihood of those things happening and repeating themselves becomes that much higher. This is important stuff for you guys. I want to navigate. It's an interesting conversation because we're going to navigate, you know, the, our inner world in our lives and money in this conversation today. As you described, Peter Diamandis, your dear friend, was not on very long ago. It was just a few weeks ago. Peter was on. We were talking about exactly what you're talking about, life extension. And if you can stick around another 20 or 30 years, you may get an additional 20, 30, 40 years on the back end of your life, which is great. But the other thing I think about is it means you need more money. If you're going to live longer, you got to have more money. If, if you're going to be living to eight, I mean, if people pass away now in their mid seventies and that's the potential that many of you that are listening to this in your thirties and forties or fifties, 
will live past 100 and maybe significantly past 100. This financial question becomes even more paramount in people's lives because you're going to need more of it to live. And so I want to start out with some basic things that you teach, and then we're going to get some pretty complicated, not complicated, but sophisticated, interesting stuff, everybody. So first things first is you kind of have these four, what I'd call basic principles regarding money yeah. that I think most yeah. people aren't familiar with. I mean, the conversation, well, you're not taught it in school. You're not taught it in college. It's not taught in most families, but I love these principles, everything from the diversification to asset allocation. Why don't you just start with that, Tony? Just illustrate kind of the, the framework of having a financial education or some financial sense. Well, uh, first I'd say the biggest challenge for most Americans is they are not owners, right? Most Americans are consumers. We have all this advertising okay. to consume, consume. So if you're going to own an iPhone, you know, maybe you want to own Apple, you know, because that iPhone is mm -hmm. going down in value and you're going to get a new one. Why not have uh, mm -hmm. own the company? I'm not saying you got to buy Apple, but I'm just giving it as an example. Become an owner. Yep. Become an owner. You got to do mm -hmm. something very basic. Everybody spends all the money they have and you have to make one discipline and make the decision that says, I'm going to create a freedom fund, whatever age I am. I'm not going to wait till it's too late. And I'm going to take 10 or 15% or whatever percentage of my income and never see it. I'm going to have arrange it to automatically go into an account and then I'll figure out how to invest it. But I got to not see mm -hmm. it because as long as you don't do that, you're not going to get where you want to go. I, there's a guy that mm -hmm. I talk about in one of my early books who worked for UPS, um, Theodore Johnson's his name. He never made more than $14,000 a year and retired with $70 million. How is oh that humanly gosh. possible? Because so, one of his awesome. friends said, we're going to make you wealthy in your long term. He goes, I'll never be wealthy. I make 14 grand a year. He goes, you're going to be wealthy. We're going to take 20% of what you earn, put it aside and invest it, which by the way, he put it in UPS primarily. He was a driver, but right. later became you know a, a low-level executive. And people loved him. He loved delivering and people loved the state. He put him in. They look forward to seeing him. But 20%, mm -hmm. he goes, I can't do that. I can't live on what I have. And the guy said, if the government passed a law and said you had to pay 20% more taxes, you'd scream, you'd yell, and you'd pay it. So you got to yep. set a number in and automate it. And then where do you put interjection it? Interjection on that. Just inter interjection real quick. I want you to keep going. This is a really important point, guys. You guys know that I built a financial company for 30 years. Yes. And here's the here's the false belief system. And I'm going to let Tony rip through this because it's awesome. People think, once I get around to making a lot of money, then I'll start saving this 10 or 20%. Here's what my experience is. If you can't begin to save money, even when you're at a lower income level, you will not do it ultimately when you make more money. You'll upgrade from the Honda to the Lexus. You'll yes. upgrade from the apartment to the condo. And then when you make a little bit more, you go from the condo to the single family residence, the Lexus to the Mercedes, and you never get around to having that money you never see end up in savings and investments. So it's critical you begin to find a way to do that at any level of income somehow, some way. Go it's, for it. Back to you on that. spot on. And if you do it in the early days, I mean, if you're a kid and you put, a, you know, you put aside $300 a month because you got low overhead out of your money. You, you can start that at 17 and because of compounding, you could stop that literally at, you know, if you start at 17, you can stop at 27 and you put very little money in and it'll grow to a, almost $2 million. If it just put it in the stock market, an 8% compounded return. If you wait till you're 27 to start, you're going to have to invest till you're 65 and you'll still have less mm -hmm. money. So the sooner you start, the better. Also, your point also relates to philanthropy. People go, you know, yeah, I'll give money when I'm rich. One thing I figured out early on, if you won't give a dime out of a dollar, you're not going to give 10 million out of 100 million or a billion really out of 10 true. million. And so really when true. you do that, by the way, you teach your brain there's more than enough. So that's the philosophical part. When I did, I've done three books, two of them, number, the third one's just now coming out, but both the other two are number one New York Times bestseller. So the first one was Money Master the Game, then Unshakable. And when I was doing those books, I went interviewed, none of it was my opinion. I said, let me interview the smartest people in the world financially, the Ray Dalios, the Carl Icons, the Warren Buffetts, the Paul Tudor Joneses. And I knew a lot in this area. I've coached Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 traders in history for 25 years now, I think it is, 24 years, something like that. And so I've seen every day what he does all those times, coached him. I knew a lot. But when I interviewed these people, they're all different. And I was looking for what do they do in common that makes them wealthy? I knew that all self-made billionaires, nobody from the Lucky Sperm Club. And there were four core things they all agreed on, even if they did completely different types of investing. The first core principle is different. It's so simple, different than most investors. The best investors are focused on not losing money. If you ask Warren Buffett, he has this famous two rules. Step one, he said, rule number one to investing, don't lose money. Rule number two, see rule number one, right? 
Now that's easy, to, <laughs> right. easy to say, but most people are like, what kind of return am I going to get? The way they don't lose money is the second key. And when I interview all of them, they all agree on one thing. There's only a few things you can manipulate to make more money. You can make better choices, like which stocks or bonds or real estate or whatever to invest in. Uh, you can have better timing. And then there's asset allocation. And when I interviewed David Swenson from Yale, he took them from $1 billion in their entire century of development. He grew their annuity to $31 billion during his time there. It's unbelievable what he did. He said, Tony, you're going to be wrong no how smart you are about picking the right stock or bond. You're going to be wrong. And you're going to be wrong on timing. The only thing, 95% of your investment returns are based on what he called asset allocation. And they all agree with that. It means if I'm going to invest $1,000, 10000 a million, whatever it is, I need to in advance have a plan of what percentage am I going to put in low risk environments where I'm going to have low risk, but low return, but it's steady. It's like the turtle. And then I'm going to have some that are environments where there's more risk, but there's the potential for upside. And then how I diversify that to protect myself, not all my eggs in one basket, it's going to be critical. Most people know that. Well, these guys have developed very specific asset allocations. And one of the things that happened when I went to go write this book, this third book, I decided I was going to look at a different type of investment, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is private equity, private real estate, private credit. Yeah. And when I did that, I interviewed some of the smartest people alive in this area. And I found out by doing my research, KKR, other people show, that extremely high net worth people have a completely different asset allocation than the average person. They have 46% of their money, not in stocks, not in bonds, not in REITs, but in private real estate, private credit, and the biggest one is private equity. And so it's like knowing the formula. Third, third piece is really important. These guys are all smart enough to know you don't take giant risks because if you have a stock worth $100 or $100,000 and it drops 50%, you have to make 100% to get even. If 100,000 drops to 50 and you grow it back 50, you only have $75,000. So they right. understand this. So they always look at risk differently than most of us. They look to see how they can get asymmetrical risk reward. That's a big word. It means how do I take the least risk with the most upside? So Paul Tudor Jones, I've coached for this, you know, basically quarter of a century almost. And with Paul, his whole philosophy is I don't want to make an investment. I may be wrong, but I'm going to believe that I can make, I'm going to risk a dollar to make five, not risk a dollar to make 10% or 20% like most people. I'm looking for a five to one. That way, if I'm wrong, I can risk another dollar. I still make four. He can be wrong four times out of five and break even. So that puts the game totally in a different place. And so the problem is most people don't know where to find asymmetrical risk reward. So I look for those places to show them. And then the final one is the one we all know, diversification. You want to not put all your eggs in one basket. Diversification is the only free lunch. And that diversification means diversifying, not putting all your money in one stock, not putting all your money in stocks. So it's not just the type of investment, the category, or you don't buy one piece of real estate. You got to diversify locations, elements. You got to diversify across timelines. So diversification is great. So all of these guys agreed to those four. So I, I was thrilled with what I did. And Money Master the Game is the most successful financial book of the last 24 years of this century, 23 years. So I'm proud of it. And Unshakable also exploded. But what I was fascinated by was people are so crunched right now. The biggest question yeah. people are asking is like, how do I get those returns? And so, you know, yes. for years, bonds were so low, everybody put all their money in the stock market. And, you know, yeah. for the most time they got by with it, a few times there were significant drops, but it's only a matter of time before the system balances out. Now bonds have raised, right? And we've seen mm -hmm. that you can get some returns on bonds in the 5% range pretty easily. But most people need more of that kind of return, a larger rate to get to where they want to be financially. So yeah. this is the part most people don't know. 35 out of the last 35 years, private equity, which is companies that have their own money, that invest in companies, they buy a piece of the company or all the company, they change the CEO, they change the marketing, they grow it. They don't just yeah. buy something hoping it'll go up, they make it better, and then they sell it for a multiple of the growth they got to a larger company or they take it public. 35 out of 35 years across the world, private equity, average private equity has outdone every stock market in the world. So I'll give you an example. In the US, for the last 35 years, the S&P 500 has given a 9.2% return. So you're compounding your money on average 9.2%, which is damn good. 
but yeah. private equity, average private equity, not the guys I've got in this book, right? These guys, mm -hmm. by the way, average 20% or more for decades, continuously compounding. It's mind boggling what they do because it's a totally different approach. It's And they don't have to sell when the market goes up and down. So when it goes down, they buy. When it goes up, they sell. Yeah. Because the money's usually locked up for about five years in most of these situations. So they have cash flow. They're in great shape. Anyway, think of this. 9.2% private equity average ones are 14.2. Now, let me explain what that means. Since the average investor may not understand. That's 50%, this is mind blowing right here. 50% greater returns every year compounded year after year. So let me help you understand what that means. If you, if you take a round number, a million dollars you put in the stock market 35 years ago. In the S&P 500, it's worth $26 million today if you never did another thing. It's pretty unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But if you put it in private equity, it's worth $139 million right now. That's why ultra high net worth people have almost half of their money in private equity and only 29% in public equities. Public equities are still important. They give you liquidity. you got access to great companies. It's fantastic. It's not like you get rid of it, but they complement each other. But higher net worth people know this is where I'm going to get the better returns. You got to fish where the fish are. And so that's why I got myself involved in this new book because there's so much more than that in this area, but just to give you a little feeling for it. Taste well, there's also so much more than that in the book, by the way, everybody. And why does this matter? Because we're going to get to your life stuff and mindset stuff. I know all of you are like, Hey, you have Tony Robbins on there, Ed. you guys, the two of you better be talking about that, which we're going to in a minute. Why is this relevant? So it's no secret that last year, one of my goals was to learn to speak Spanish. And I got to tell you something, I've gotten pretty fluent in Spanish and there's only one reason, and that's Babbel. Babbel is a number one learning language app in the history of mankind and has changed my life because it's taught me in short, easy to understand lessons how to speak Spanish in a fluent way. And you can learn any language in there. Basically, got a ton of different languages. The courses are quick, 10, 20 minute courses. You're going to love it. If you want to learn a new language this year or you want your children to learn a new one or maybe just improve in one you're already pretty proficient at, Babbel's the place to do it. 10 million subscriptions sold already, plus all of Babbel's 14 language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. It's a no-brainer. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, you get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash mylet, which is M-Y-L-E-T-T. Get 55% off babbel.com slash mylet, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash mylet. Rules and restrictions may apply. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. And I have to tell you something, I'm so honored that it is because I'm such a believer in therapy. I don't think enough people dive into therapy. You know, therapy's for a lot of different reasons, all the way that you're really going through a very difficult time or traumatic thing in your past that you want to work through all the way to maybe just today. You just need somebody to talk to and bounce some ideas off of and express yourself. Therapy is something that most of the guests you've seen on my show all have in common, is that at one time in their life or they're currently in some form of therapy because it can help you work through trauma, challenges, problems, blocks mentally that you may have. And what I love about BetterHelp, it can be done online. You can switch your therapist at any time if you don't click with them. It's just an awesome environment and it's really, really affordable. I totally completely recommend BetterHelp. So celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash edshow today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash edshow. I'm so thrilled that you many years ago started writing these books, this trilogy, and here's the reason why. It's very difficult to have some element con of control over your life if you're not trying to exert some type of control over the financial piece of your life. Yeah. So we're always talking about our minds and our bodies in the personal development space. And Tony was obviously the, the first person, the most cutting edge person to do that. But there are other elements in our life. And if you're out of control financially and you live that way for years and years and years and years, it has an impact on the other elements of your life. Yeah. And so understanding these parts of, it's the part of the, success piece of the puzzle that's almost never discussed because it's that thing we're going to get around to doing eventually. That's like saying, I'm going to get my mindset right and I'm going to get around to getting my body together. We all know they're correlated yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. So when we talk about this, Tony, you know, there's something you said in the book that I actually want to ask you for my own edification because I don't know. Private equity has been reserved for the wealthy for many, many years. And in the book, you allude to the fact that 
there may be there was legislation pending that may allow eventually unaccredited investors to participate. It was a bipartisan type submission. Has that happened yet? And if it hasn't happened yet, what's the likelihood that it will? Well, it's already passed the House and it was bipartisan. And when they come back okay. from the holiday, they're going to vote it on the Senate and there's bipartisan support. And what it does is for the people unaware of this, these investments this big. are the biggest returns you can get, but you have to have a special status to go there. It's like only the most wealthy people get access. It's so unfair. And so what's interesting is they say, well, because you got to be sophisticated. Well, no, you just have to understand how it works. But what's interesting right. is you might be wealthy because you built a business and sold it. That doesn't make you a sophisticated investor. So the new rules mm -hmm. are that when passed by the House, the Senate looks like it's going to as well. And uh, the new rules are simple. You take a test and you become an accredited investor. Normally, you have to have a million dollar net worth or $200,000 a year in income or $300,000 per couple if for you to be mm -hmm. an accredited investor, which gives you access to some of these. And then there's another level, which is a qualified purchaser, which you have $10 million of investable assets, not counting your home and count your business. Mm -hmm. So those things have limited who has access. But even if you have money, it's worse than that. Think of it this way. It's kind of like the velvet rope to the best clubs. You know, you're out front and somebody wants to get in because it's the club to get in. <laughs> these, these firms have such great returns that it's like buying an exotic car or the velvet rope. You know, it's like they're all gone right away. The pension funds get them. The wealthiest yep. people in the world get them, right? The family offices get them. And so I, you know, because I had relationships, got access to a few of them, but yeah. I was frustrated. I couldn't even get in. And then I, I, yep. it didn't matter whether I was qualified or not. I couldn't get past the velvet mm -hmm. rope. You're out in the cold with your money. It doesn't matter. You can't do it. Yep. <clears throat> but here's the breakthrough. So in coaching Paul Tudor, I got to know one of Paul Tudor's partners who eventually uh, started his own firm. And we were talking one day and I was talking about the unbelievable returns that come from these private equity, private credit, private real estate type firms. And how frustrating I am because every time I want to get into one, I can't get in or I get this really <laughs> tiny allocation that I can get in with, right? It's not me. Yep. And he goes, Tony, he said, um, and he kind of dropped down almost to a whisper. And he goes, brother to brother, I should probably tell you where most of my money goes. And I said, well, great. I kind of leaned in. I mean, this is a brilliant financial mm -hmm. guy, right? He goes, did you know that the word they use when you invest in these firms, they call you a limited partner, an LP. Mm -hmm. And if you own the firm, well, you own all the funds, you're the owner of the firm, you're, you know, CEO, CFO, you're in the C-suite, that type of thing, then you're an owner. Well, the owners, they don't just make what the fund makes, they make 2% on every dollar you give them, and it's tied up for five yeah. years so that they have liquidity. So the market goes up and down, they don't have to worry about that, and they can make sure they give you the yeah. best return. So you tie up your funds for a little longer for a better return. Well, they get 2% a year, whether you make money or not. And then when they grow it, they get 20% of the upside. And that's standard in the industry. So picture this. Everybody loves guaranteed cash flow. He goes, you know, Tony, these are the wealthiest people in the world. If you go to the Fortune 400 and you say, who are the richest people in the world? Are they in tech? Are they in real estate? No, they're financial right. services right. guys. And they're not hedge fund guys because they they go up and down. Some of them, but very few. Mm -hmm. It's the private mm -hmm. equity guys. And he goes, so here, because they're making the two and 20. So imagine this, you have a billion dollars and you're making $20 million a year of guaranteed fees for five years, $100 million guaranteed. If they take their billion dollar firm and they raise it to 2 billion, they grow it over those five years, they get 20% of the upside. That means they made 100 million in fees, 200 million upside. That's 300 million on initial billion dollar investment. Now I have one firm mm -hmm. I invested in when we had started with them, they had 13 billion. They have 100 billion now. So they're making $2 billion a year in fees alone, to give you an idea. I get that two in 20. He said, you can become a partial owner of the general partnership. And like I said, I've got 65 firms now that I own two in 20 on. So I am literally a GP. I'm right beside them. And I get about you know 10% a year in income. They vary from 5 to 10%, but about 10% of income. And they get the growth in the business. And if they ever sell the business, I get a multiple on the business. So this is like one of those almost unknown secrets. Even most wealthy people I know are unaware of this. When they hear this, they go crazy because it's the firm they're trying to get in, but now they own it. And I don't just own that fund. You get diversification. I get the funds they invested when there was low inflation. I get the funds that they're investing in now. I get the funds they invest in the future. It's, it's, it's a wild opportunity. So that's just one of them in the book. Another one is sports teams. I worked till I became fairly wealthy and then I wanted to buy a sports team. And the first team I got in was the LAFC football club because we were starting it out. I was one of the original 
owners that started up and, you know, we won a national championship. It's pretty cool, but the growth and it's been fun. It's been great. But I went through a year's microscope to qualify to do that. And you got to put some serious yes. money on the line, right? To, to yes. own a team, a piece of a team. Yes. Well, there's new rules that have been changed in the last three, four years. And if you have the right firm, there's only a few that do it. You can own multiple sports teams, small slices of them. And here's why that's valuable. The S&P 500, the last 10 years, has had a great run, 11% compounded just in the last 10 years. It's 18% for Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, and soccer combined. It's, mm. to give you the idea, Michael Jordan bought the piece of the Hornets, what uh, was it, 13 years ago, I think, 12, 13 years ago. He paid $325 million. He just sold it for $3 billion, right? My friend Peter Guber bought the LA Dodgers a few years back with a couple of partners, yep. Magic Johnson, a couple other guys, and they paid $2 billion for the LA Dodgers. Now, no one had paid even a billion. The most ever been spent on a baseball team was $850 million. So everybody said he's insane. They've overpaid at least a billion dollars. And I called Peter's my friend and partner, and I said, Peter, you're no dummy. I hear what everybody's saying. I know that you know something no one's telling you. And he, you know, he's made 52 Academy Award nominated movies. He's a genius. And so I said, mm -hmm. he said, I'm going to leave you on. He said, we're dear friends, but he goes, I want to leave you in suspense. I'm going to make an announcement next week. As soon as you hear it, call me and we'll laugh our tails off together. Sure enough, the next week they announce he bought it for $2 billion. He sold the local, not the national rights. You get a piece of every team's, an equal piece of every team's media. It's pretty cool. But the local you yeah. own. He sold the local rights for the Dodgers television for $7 billion. He made $5 billion oh, immediately. So they're not just oh big butts and seats anymore. They're media companies. 92% of the top 100 shows last year were sports shows in terms of viewership. And it's great because they don't mm. have to, like, to make a series on Netflix, you got to buy the actors. You just set up your cameras and you shoot and you're ready to go. And everybody watches because of cord cutting, they still watch and they'll still watch the ads. So it's an incredibly yeah. lucrative business. Imagine it's a legal monopoly. You own that yeah. business. No one can compete with you in those cities. And you have fanatics. That's what fans comes from. Fanatics. Fanatical customers yeah. who, when you charge more for the, you know, inflation goes up and you pay 10 bucks for a hot dog, people pay it. And they've been coming back mm -hmm. for generations. It's an unbelievable mm -hmm. business. A third opportunity real fast. You know, bonds. Bonds have produced nothing up until this massive increase in the interest rates we've gone through that's been devastating for many banks that were holding on to bonds, right? Well, mm. in 2021, people were so starving for income, you know, from a bond that the junk bonds went crazy. There was this explosion in people buying junk bonds because they could make 3.9% instead of like 1% or 2%. And this has taken big risk to make less than 4%. I was making 9% on private credit the entire time with less risk. And so private credit is because banks, you know, you saw what happened in Silicon Valley, right? Banks, banks are tightened up and they don't loan as much. So companies that are anywhere from hundred million to say three to 4 billion, there's 200,000 companies like that in the United States that are borrowing money all the time and who they borrow from is private credit. But here's what's interesting. If you don't know private credit, I can give it to you in a metaphor. If you had a house right now and you got a mortgage rate at, say, 3% or 4%, whatever, back then, and it was fixed, you don't care that the interest rates went up. You're doing great. But if it's readjusts, if it's a floating rate, you could be in trouble. Well, all these business loans are floating rate. So these private credit firms loan money at 5 and 6%. That's what bank, or excuse mm -hmm. bank, business was borrowing at. And guess what? When the interest rates went up, they float with it. So now they're paying 11% plus. Well, it's the same wow. loan. <laughs> it's the same time period, but you just doubled or tripled, in some cases, your income stream when you own the private credit. Mm -hmm. Plus, I get the two and 20. So it's like, right. these are, you don't get, you don't have to get rid of your bonds. These are a complement to your bonds, but they're much, two to three times higher returns. There's the energy industry. I might go on and on and on. I, so here's the most important part, though. The reason it's called the holy grail to investing is because I interviewed Ray Dalio, you know, 10 years ago. Now we've become good friends over the years. And I asked him a simple question. I said, the most successful investor in history, he's got his fund manages Bridgewater, almost $200 billion in business. They do it for countries even. And I said, you've got the big, best track record out there. What is the single most important investment principle that any investor needs to know? He goes, Tony, you know the importance of diversification. 
But people think of that in general, don't put too many eggs in one basket. He said, I turned that into a science of saying, how do I get the asymmetric risk reward? I have the least amount of risk and the most amount of upside. And he said, I found out it's simply this. He called it the holy grail. He goes, the holy grail of investing is to find eight to 12 uncorrelated investments. Now, uncorrelated, just so everybody understands, stocks and bonds usually have been uncorrelated. The idea that people put you in like 60% stocks and 40% bonds is that, okay, when stocks go down, bonds will make up for it or vice versa. Well, the only problem with that is during really rough times like 2020, they both went down equally. 2008, down. huge drops. And then your broker will tell you, gosh, no one could foresee this. It happens every time. You can foresee it. Right. So, right. But, but, but they don't foresee it is what they're really saying, right? So right. he said, look, you find eight to 12 uncorrelated investments, you reduce your risk 80% and you increase your upside. You are protecting mm -hmm. yourself while increasing your, your lowering your risk and re increasing your return. So it's like taking those core four and putting them on steroids that I told you. Yeah, you guys, here's the value of all of this. Just I want to just stamp this for a second too, okay? It's the holy grail of investing. You need to go get it or pre-order it now. It wasn't until I was worth nine figures that I knew what private equity was. And then it's still, I remember the day I finally got involved in one, like you said, it was like a waiting for the rope at the club, right? Yeah. And so I can just validate these things. So it's not, it's by, it's public information that I was a part of the group trying to buy the Mets that we lost out to Cohen. I wanted to get involved in major league baseball. We were the runner up to that group, private real estate. I've even done some bridge loan investing stuff that's private as well. This is the first book, honestly, I've ever read that does let you peer into what the mega wealthy and mega successful are doing and gives you access to the information. I have literally never read a book like this before. Yeah, I and I can tell you that it took me to like, I have never. I'm grateful you wrote it. I'm grateful we're talking about it because it's, I was 45 years old and worth multiple nine figures before any of these things were even ever explained to me. And so if I if I could have known this earlier in my journey, you guys, it'd be a game changer. And just imagine this, just being armed with this knowledge, the confidence that it would give you that you can win in your life. And that's just part of the game. I think most of us feel like the game is kind of rigged against us. And to some extent, you're right. There's been lots of places you haven't had access to yeah. that this book will at least enlighten you as to where to go get that access and to have an education regarding it. In private credit? Do you know what their dropout ratio is of loans that go bad? Less than 1%. Mm. Any bank would die for that because they don't the sell those loans. rates 1%. That's awesome. Their money is on the line. They don't sell the loans off. So they're very picky about right. who they pick and they've got great right. leverage in terms of those relationships. And the other part you got to know is literally everything is moving towards alternative investments. If you don't know about That's these right. things, how are you ever going to take advantage? And then you think, like you said, the system's rigged against you. It is unless you educate yourself. If you educate That's yourself, right. I didn't learn about most of these things till I was 48 years old. And like you said, it's hard yeah. to get into some yeah. of these pieces to make happen. Now, this yeah. is yeah. Th this is the democratization of alternative investments. And here's the other problem yeah. you got to know. 1996, there are 8,000 stocks you could pick from in the US. There's only 3,600 now. If you look at the S&P, no, if you look at the Russell 2000, 40% of those firms are not profitable. 40% yeah. don't make money. So people are basically yeah. betting in these environments, hoping in these environments. Yeah. So I love being side by side as a partner with some of the smartest people in the world. So for example, if you go to Robert Smith at Vista, he does SaaS, right? Software as a service. He has built a system so he can take any company on, give them the right coaching, knows what to do to grow them. It's like a cookie cutter. He grows them, expands them, sells them for huge profit, goes to, goes to the next one. These people in this area, what I love about it is they're adding value. It isn't just a hope and a bet. It's like, we're going to take this company on and we're going to find a way to make it better, stronger, more valuable. And then we're going to get a piece of that upside. That has been whole my whole philosophy in life is do more for others than anybody else does. Add more value and you'll prosper. But you can't prosper if you're unaware of it. And by the way, the book, you know, I don't know when people will be hearing this, but the book yeah. February 13 gets released. But if you go pre-order it and then you go to... Um, uh, the holy grail of investing.com holy grail of investing .com. there's a website there and if you just give your digital receipt i'll give you the first chapter today on audio that you can Very listen cool. to immediately and it already gives you some of the tools that'll blow your mind so you don't have to wait 
It's very cool, you guys. And by the way, I know a lot of you, your only viewpoint of this kind of stuff is like Gordon Gecko from the days and they destroy these companies. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not, it's not how private equity works now. As Tony said, they're making these companies better, more profitable. They execute for the consumer better as well. Right. So everybody wins here for the for the most part. So let's shift gears because we're going to run out of time and I want to make sure that we get a chance to cover it. You said something earlier about, you know, with the Russell 2000, 40% are not doing anything. They're losing money and we're sort of hoping. That hope is not a strategy is something I learned from you many, many years ago regarding life as well. I think more than ever, Tony, people feel a sense of what because you and I are in the same world. We coach some of the same people. We have the same sorts of people come to our events. More than ever, I feel like people feel like they can't get control over their lives. And that's why the financial piece is so important. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are if you were to give somebody counsel first coming to this event, but where would they begin? Obviously, I know you talk a lot about mind and body. You talk about having role models that are important, but I kind of turn the floor over to you. Someone's listening. They're sort of like, hey, man, you know, I want to get control of my life. The, the money part, awesome. What about my life? What about my emotions? Yeah. What about my family? Yeah. What would you say to them? I think the first thing you got to do is you got to create a compelling future. What I mean by that is anybody can deal with difficult today if they have a compelling tomorrow. Right now, mm -hmm. uh, there's so much fear in the world that people are afraid. I hear millennials talking about they don't want to have kids because they want to bring them this world that's such a terrible world. Uh, there's so much yeah. violence. There's less violence today in the world, even though we have this horrible war that's going on, two of them now. Uh, there's more yeah. than two, but the two that most people are familiar mm -hmm. with, with obviously what's happening right. over there in Russia and Ukraine and also what's happening in Israel and Gaza. Um, but mm -hmm. we have less of that than we've ever had, even in the middle of this. But the mm -hmm. fear is bigger. The promotion of it, the watching about it, the arguing about it, all that is enhanced by the way that we live today and the fears that are today. So what I tell people is you need to create a compelling future. You need to understand whether you're on the path or not. I mean, think about the hero's journey just for a second. What is the hero's journey? Mm -hmm. You're living your life over and over and it's boring. You can pick any great story of humanity, all the same stories. They're all the hero's story at some level. And then something disrupts mm -hmm. it. Something creates a challenge. It's the call to become more. It's the call to go on adventure. You might have lost your job. You may have lost money. You may have been told you got cancer. You might have gone through a divorce. You know, there's a that's we look at it as it's horrific experience, but I've experienced, I know you have as well, multiple experiences. Someone telling me, mm -hmm. you know, I've buried, you know, three fathers and a mother. Uh, you know, I've been in a mm -hmm. place where they said, Hey, you got a tumor in your brain. You're not, you may not survive. Mm -hmm. I've been in those moments that were scary as hell, but they were calls to be able to grow. And then you go on the journey. And as you go on the journey, it's amazing. When you commit to grow, when you commit to figure it out, you get yourself on that path. What's going to happen is you're going to meet mentors. You're going to meet people along the way that'll show up that can help you. And you're going to have to face your dragons. You're going to have to see mm -hmm. what is it that you're is stopping you. So I look at it this way. The first step, if you want to make your relationship better or your business better or your emotion, anything that you value, your finances better, the first step to being on the path, am I on the path or not? Like the first one is, mm -hmm. do you know what you really want? As simplistic as that is. Most mm -hmm. people know what they don't want. And so where focus mm -hmm. goes, energy flows. So the first step yeah. is like, what do I really want? Why do I want it? Because the why is even more important than what? It's like New Year's, right? People set their goals or their New Year's resolutions, and by February, they're gone, right? They're, they're already broken them because they just were expressing what they wanted, not why they wanted. They didn't get enough reasons to push themselves through when it was difficult, and they didn't have a good plan. So the first thing is, what do I want? Why do I want it? Who do I got to become to make that happen? And you get crystal clear. Now you're on the path. What's the second step of the path? Now you got to be honest. You got to get to the truth and tell yourself the truth about the gap. Because all of us have a gap between where we are and where we want to be. And if you want to close that gap quickly, the only way to do it is to be honest. <laughs> the truth sets you free. So you get clear, where am I really compared to where I want to be and why? What's prevented me in the past from losing that weight, from making that money, from having a relationship last, from growing that business? And there's only a few things that prevent you. It's fear. It's, and, I'm, and there's all kinds of fears, but fear. It's limiting beliefs. Well, I've never done it before. I don't know what to do. I'm not that kind of person. I don't know numbers. All my relationships end up, all the good ones are gone. Whatever the belief is, there's a limiting belief, there's a fear, or there's some other primer emotion in the way, or it's a habit, or the fifth one is you're missing a skill. Like learning to mm. invest is a skill. If you don't take the time to learn it, you're going to be in pain, right? Because you're going to always mm -hmm. be trying to earn it. And most people think, well, I'll make so much money 
that I'll never have to worry about when I hit the big thing. Well, the people that make the hit the big thing, the athletes, the entertainers, usually are broke 20 years later. You've seen it over and over That's and right. over again because they made the big dollars. Right. They have the big overhead, but they never learn how to make money while they sleep. They never learn to be an mm -hmm. owner, right? An investor. They just made yeah. income and no income yeah. is enough. <laughs> Mike Tyson's a friend of mine. Mike made a billion dollars over his career, just short of a billion dollars and lost it all. You know, I can give you 50 cent, 50 cent made all this money. He bought Mike's house and then he went broke. <laughs> give you an idea. Uh, you know, Elton John overspent and lost all the money he had. And unfortunately he made it back eventually to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, that is not the solution that you need. So if you really want to transform, you get on the path, figure out what's missing. Then what do you do? Now you come up with a, a you know, a quick plan, not a perfect plan, but a quick plan to attack it with massive action. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do? Now you got to face your dragons. You got to make the changes that are necessary. Then you have some daily practices. Mm -hmm. There's like seven steps to this. You measure and you celebrate and you begin again. So I teach people the exact path. And if you're not on the path, it's scary. If you're not on the path to financial security or freedom, it's scary. If you're not on the path to quality relationship or you're on a path right now that's leading to pain, you better educate yourself, but you got to start with what you want and why you want it. Then you got to see what's wrong with you, not your partner. What's the challenge? What's mm -hmm. the habit? What's the emotion? What's the triggers? Got to take a little action plan. You got to make the changes. And this process, you know, the hero's journey is you go on the journey, you become more by facing these challenges, you learn and you grow, and then you bring that back home and you experience you know, the rewards of being the hero in your own life. And that's in essence mm -hmm. what people need to be able to do. And it's not that mm -hmm. hard because there's patterns. There's certain patterns that work. I don't care what the color of your skin is, how old you are or young you are. I don't care what your nationality is. I don't care what gender you are or your sexual preference. These are the, are the laws of life. If you understand the laws and you align with them, you do well. So one of the reasons we do this three-day process is in three days for just two and a half, three hours a day, people are able to get clear what they want exactly in each of these areas. They get clear what's gotten in the way. They put, come up with their plan. They start to face their demons and they move the ball forward. And that's how you get the kind mm. of results that we've seen people get that are just mind boggling. You know, the people that just mm. came and spent three days with us. And if they want to go deeper, they can go to some other event, but we don't hold it back. It's not partially free. It's totally free. And I encourage people mm. not only come and do this because it's January 25th through the 27th. It's right around the time your news resolutions, you had them are probably going out the window and you can do right. it with your friends or you can do it with your family together. You can do it from home. You don't have to travel. You don't have an expense or you can go to the office and do it with a group of your friends at the office type of thing. But I promise you a big experience mm -hmm. you won't forget. So you just, you know, if you get yourself in immersion, that's how it changes. The problem is people try to a little bit at a time. It's like trying to learn a language a little bit at a time. People that learn language in high school and college usually don't speak it 10 years later. But if I dumped you in Italy with no teacher and said, I'm picking you up in 90 days, because you're seeing it, breathing it, being around it, around all day long, in immersion, you learn the language. Last question. By the way, thank you for today. We've oh, certainly maxed out the Always hour. We're a little bit over on an hour. But people get a chance to hear you, hear the two of us together, and this thing just explodes every single time. Hard question. So, and, and dig deep on this one for me. So, you have a precious new little girl. I guess she's getting older now, but every time we talk, I keep saying this precious new baby, but yeah. she's actually older now. And my son, Max, is a college golfer, and he's a really good golfer. He's probably going to go play it professionally. And this weekend, I was watching Tiger and his son play in that uh, the parent-child uh, tournament on, yeah. on TV this weekend. And I was thinking uh, his son has such an advantage because his dad's Tiger Woods. I mean, it's a pretty good model and mentor for your golf swinger, how to chip, how to putt, how to hit a driver. And I was thinking it kind of sucks that for Max that I'm his dad <laughs> because I have I have literally nothing to offer him except how to do these things wrong on the golf course. So literally today, no joke, Tony, today I'm like, who's the best golf instructor in the world? Turns out the dude follows me and I reach out to the guy. I said, I'd like to hire you to coach my son. He basically says, no, I only work with PGA Tour players, but if you'll coach me, I'll trade you for lessons. The point that I'm making to you is. It's awesome to have a coach that's the best in the world that you can model. Tiger's got that with his son. And your daughter, to some extent, will have that with you as it terms in terms of life strategy. And so I'm just curious. I asked you this kind of last time, and I said, what would you wish for her? And you said, I'd wish love. But your daughter's going to grow up in a world that is this AI world, you know, that you and I didn't grow up in. And it's going to be 
all this new frontier, there's this new technological revolution that we're now in the middle of. She's going to live probably a lot longer than you and I will, right? She's going to have a totally different world geopolitically to some extent than you and I did. So the challenges of life for this young girl when she becomes a young woman out in the world are going to be unique. And so you're the Tiger Woods of of life and and bliss strategy. Let's call you that right now. What what are are there three things, a few things you would wish that she was equipped with when she leaves your home with you and Sage someday? She goes out into the world and you said, I want her armed and equipped with this. For Tiger, it's for his son in golf, it's how to chip or putt or how to hit a cut or a draw on the golf course. But in the game of life, I'm curious as to what you would want her equipped with when she someday, unfortunately, leaves your home and goes out into the world. What would you want her to take with her? I put a lot of thought into that, obviously. I, you know, I have five kids and five grandkids, and I have a daughter that's 48, as I said, and a daughter that's two and a half. So I have quite a range. Right. My daughter is, you know, my my grandkids are all older than my daughter, and she's their, you know, aunt. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> but uh, the answer to your question is, number one, as I want her to have a philosophy of life that will guarantee happiness, and there's only one that I know of, and that is life is about growth and giving. And so even at two and a half, she has responsibilities in the house as part of this family. She cleans her own table. You know, she takes her, her fork and her stuff. She brings it in. When we, at the end of the night, and we do all our vitamins, we give them one for everybody. And then she goes and shares them. And she gives other people theirs first, then hers, right? Life is about people. The biggest challenge for people are unfulfilled as they think life's about me when it's really about we. There's only so much joy you can experience in your own body through anything, you know, massive success, acknowledgement from others. I don't know, sex, music, rock and roll, doesn't matter. By yourself, yeah. it's only so much. When you have a great experience in life, the first thing you want to do is share with somebody you love, right? So it's really life is calling us to grow because when we grow, we have something to give. And so she's learning Chinese right now, Spanish and English. And we were at a table uh, last week. And there was a person speaks Chinese person, and she was talking back and forth between us and English. And I know some of those Chinese words and some of those Spanish words, not as much as she knows already at two and a half. She's doing algebra right now. I, I started her when she was a little baby. She's swimming right now. She has plenty of time just to be them. And I want for her autonomy. I want her, everything we do with her, we don't tell her what to do. We give her choices. You want to do this or that? And she gets to choose. And some of them have consequences, but she gets to choose. She always knows there's a choice. People always tell me, you know, this is, I'm stuck. It's the only thing I can do is this. That's bullshit. And one choice is no choice. Two choices is the dilemma. My belief is there's always at least three choices. You may not like them all, but there's at least three choices. And once you find three, there's four or five to get to where you want to go. So I'm teaching her mm -hmm. at two and a half to make choices. The choices have consequences. The life's about growing and giving. And I'm helping her to also recognize those patterns. Pattern, at this stage, kids are so great at patterns. So I want her to own the identity that I'm great at learning. Because for AI, for everything that's coming, you need to become learning more rapidly. And that's pattern recognition, mm. pattern utilization, and pattern creation. So, you know, she's playing the piano. I never got to have these choices. So she has all these choices, mm. but also I make sure she's not going from one class to the next class to the next class. She has time outside to just be and play and take in nature and be around. I want her to be, I want her to have her own autonomy, her own sovereignty, so that she's not influenced by what everybody else thinks. That's also why she won't be on social media for a very, very, very long time, right? So those are, as long mm. as I can control it, it'll be a long time, it'll be selective what she does. So she's, mm. she also though has modeled her family, like, you know, it's no bullshit. It's like my wife and I are so head over he's in love. We've been together 25 years now, quarter of a century, you know, so it's like, there's no fights here. We just, I want everything that makes my wife happy. She wants everything that makes me happy. So she sees this environment of such love. Plus we have so many close friends that are chosen family for us, you know? So she models that. She doesn't know anything different. Now she's going to go in a world that's not like that, but she's going to have attachment strategies that are totally secure. So she's not going to be one of those people pushing it away or starving for someone else's external affection. So that's mm -hmm. my goals. I want her to have those pieces. I want her to have choice, autonomy. I want her the philosophy of life is what are you here to give, not what are you here to get. And she's already learning that mm -hmm. at two and a half and we're only going to do more. Plus, it's not just me. My wife is unbelievable. She's the greatest mom. And we couldn't have a baby. We went through IVF for seven years, three times a year, holding my wife's hand. We'll go through that horrible surgery. And finally, and I, I kept saying, honey, we got to have a baby before I'm 50. I don't want to go to my child's high school reunion at 70. Well, now I'm going to go there when I'm 80. <laughs> high, school, high school graduation, I should say. And uh, 
but I'm I'm in a different prime of life. I'm so glad that I know what I have and I can share what I can with her. But those are my core answers. I'm always looking for new awesome. things, and my wife is doing the same. Mm -hmm. But we want her to, mm -hmm. to have joy and happiness. And, you know, mm -hmm. only one thing that makes you happy: progress. When we grow, we feel alive. Mm -hmm. If you get a gift, you get a goal, mm -hmm. you achieve your ultimate goal, you have one of two reactions. After you get it, is this all there is, which is a horrible reaction. Or, wow, this is so awesome. But how long do you keep the happiness about achieving that goal? A year? Six years? No. no. Six months? Mm -hmm. Six weeks? Mm -hmm. Six hours? Six days? Most people, somewhere mm -hmm. between six hours and six weeks is the most they stay happy because we're not supposed to stay happy. Life has made us want to keep growing. Now, you know, so when you mm -hmm. make progress, though, when you make significant progress in your body, in your relationship, in your finance, you're not there yet. You lose the first 10 pounds. Oh, you figure out how to invest and now you got something to bring you a great income and equity. Wow, you know, there's an excitement with progress that doesn't go away. So I always tell people progress is everything. How are you gonna keep making progress? That's what's gonna make you feel alive. The people you see that had all the money and all the affection and all the, you know, everything around them that people think they want, these movie stars, comedians, whoever, and take their own life. Why? In every case, if you do your homework, you can see they stop growing. They didn't feel fully alive anymore. They got rote in what they're doing. And it became all about me or they got into drugs and alcohol. And then one day in a really bad state did something really stupid. So I can't control mm -hmm. what my daughter will be like. And I don't have that delusion or illusion, but I can do the best mm -hmm. I can to give her an incredible base to make those choices from. And that's what I'm committed to. And so is my wife. And as I started to say, she has a second mom because the lady who carried for us has been a dear friend of ours, mm -hmm. chosen family for more than a decade, Mary. And so we said, Mary, you should stay with us and do this. You've helped bring her in the world. So she literally has like two moms and me so great. and all these resources. I think she's going to do okay. <laughs> so do I. And you know what? I, I think you helped a lot of people today do okay and better than okay. I'm like, uh, I'm so grateful that I'm alive when you're alive and that you've been in my life and that I get a chance that for whatever this platform that we've built here, that I get to share you with all these people that I know you and I mutually love and care about these human beings out there that are just trying to do something great with their lives and have dreams and visions and want to make a difference in the world. And like I said, when I introduced you, I, I believe that this man has helped more people do that than anybody who's lived the last hundred years on this planet. And so you should be acknowledged for that. I love you. I'm proud of you and uh, very, very grateful that you exist, brother, and that you continue to grow yourself and have all these new breakthroughs and, and deliver for so many. So thank you. Well, thank you for that, Ed. And you know, my feeling is more than mutual. I've watched you over the years just continue to grow and not just in you. your body or your business, but also you've always been a generous soul, but you're really doing your best to really help people everywhere. Same as me. So that's why I feel a brotherhood with you. I always enjoy our conversation. So thanks for having me on. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a beautiful New Year. Me Merry too, Christmas. brother. Likewise. The Holy Grail of Investing, February 13th. Pre-order if it's before. Grab it now. Spend three days with Tony, January 25th through 27th, 2024. Join Tony100.com. God bless you, everybody. Max out your life.